Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn program. I'm Alana Cohn Kennedy, the Holocaust Center's Director of Education. A live transcript for this program is available on Zoom for anyone who would like to use it. Click Live Transcript at the bottom of the screen and then click Subtitles. The Holocaust Center for Humanity is open on Sundays to the public. We invite you to come and visit, explore the incredible stories of local Holocaust survivors, and see the objects important to this history in our exhibit, Finding Light in the Darkness. When you visit the Holocaust Center, we ask you to consider the land on which you are standing. The Holocaust Center for Humanity in downtown Seattle sits on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. Thank you to our 2021 Lunch and Learn series sponsors, the Tacoma Jewish Community Fund, Verizon, Home Street Bank, and the Francis Roth and Stanley R. Schill Foundation. As a special feature today, we are opening up the chat where everyone can communicate with each other. The chat will remain open until the main program begins in a few minutes. Today's Lunch and Learn program is number 66. These virtual Lunch and Learns were started as a response to the pandemic shutdown and quarantine in March, 2020. With everyone at home and countless stories at our fingertips that could inspire, educate, and challenge us to reconsider how we understand our world today, it seemed we had a responsibility to make these stories accessible. Some of you, and we know who you are, have attended 50 or more of these programs. Others have tuned in occasionally, and for some of you, this might be your first program. Please take a minute and type in the chat and let us know how many of these programs you have attended over the past year. Over the past 66 weeks, we have featured scholars who have talked about America and the Holocaust, immigration and liberation, we have had authors like Deborah Riley Draper, who discussed her book, Olympic Pride, American Prejudice, about the Nazi Olympics and African-American athletes, and local author Neil Bascom to discuss his book, Nazi Hunters. We've also hosted local icon, Knut Berger, who introduced us to the real Nazis in the Northwest, and one of my favorites, author David Berge on Chief Seattle. You never know what might happen during a live presentation, and David's program was a good example of this. At the top of my list are the Holocaust survivors and children of survivors who bravely shared their personal stories with strangers. I'd love to hear from all of you which program or programs were your favorites. Let us know in the chat um, which ones stood out to you over the past year. Thank you for all the comments that I see coming in, and I see one that says, I have seen almost every single program. Thank you, Don and Linda. Every week, hundreds of you tune into these programs. You are keeping these stories and this history alive and through it, you help us to keep the march towards creating a world with less hate, more understanding and more justice. Through this incredible year, I thank you all for the support, the engaging questions, your listening ears and your thoughtfulness. You can find all of the past Lunch and Learn programs on our website. All uh, 66 or almost 66 of them are there with their recordings and descriptions. Over the next five weeks, we will be featuring some of our favorite Lunch and Learn programs. You will find them in your email or on, on our website and on social media. And then join us for new live programming in September. We will kick off the season on Tuesday, September 14th with a special program launching the Holocaust Center's new graphic novel, More Than Any Child Should Know, a kinder transport story of the Holocaust about beloved local Holocaust survivor, Steve Adler. And thank you to the so many of you who participated in the poll naming this new graphic novel. Following that program, we will be featuring a lineup of some of the most notable Holocaust historians and speakers in a special series, Connecting the Holocaust to Today. Details and registration information will be coming soon. Today, we have another remarkable story for you, that of Siggy Wilzig, as described in the new book, Unstoppable, Siggy B. Wilzig's astonishing journey from Auschwitz survivor and penniless immigrant to Wall Street legend. 
As a teenager, Sigi Wilsig used his wits to stay alive in Auschwitz, pretending to have trade skills the Nazis could exploit to run the camp. After two death marches and near starvation, he was liberated from Mauthausen and went to work for the US Army hunting Nazis, a service that earned him a visa to America. On arrival, he made three vows, to never go hungry again, to support the Jewish people, and to speak out against injustice. He began his career selling neckties from the trunk of his car, and in little more than a decade, rose to become CEO of a publicly traded oil company and a bank with assets in excess of $4 billion. Author Joshua M. Green is a renowned Holocaust scholar and filmmaker whose biographies have sold more than half a million copies worldwide. Joshua has been a featured speaker at the Pentagon and the Judge Advocate General's College. He was honored by the New York Public Library Distinguished Authors Series and frequently lectures at state bar associations on issues of war crimes law. He has spoken on issues of Holocaust memory for such outlets as NPR and Fox News, and his editorials have appeared in print in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and the Chicago Tribune. Also joining us is Siggy Wilsig's son, Ivan Wilsig. After more than 20 years working for his family's multi-billion dollar commercial banking business, where he also sat on the board of directors, Ivan left the banking world behind to reinvent himself as a recording artist, Sir Ivan. His love for music and his passion for peace and equality translated into a very unique sound that ultimately led him to becoming a top 10 billboard chart artist. He is also on a mission to share his father's story with the world. Ivan and Joshua will take questions at the end of the program. Please use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen at any time to type in your questions. So Joshua, I wanna start by asking you how you first heard of Siggy Wilsig's story and what inspired you to write the book, Unstoppable? Good question. Um, I've been practicing yoga for more than a half century. And someone said to me, um, have you ever heard of this guy, Sir Ivan? He's taken some yoga mantras and made them into a dance number. I said, really? <laughs> really? That sounds very unusual. So I went online and sure enough, there was Sir Ivan having taken uh, the Krishna mantra and made it into this really professionally done uh, number that kind of had you stamping your feet and all. So we were connected. And uh, at some point he said, you know, I've read some of your books about the Holocaust. So I'd really like for you to consider writing my father's story. So between the music connection and the, uh, the mutual interest in the Holocaust, uh, we got together and that was eight years ago. And uh, the result is the book Unstoppable. So that was a very big part of it. The other reason I chose to do this story was Siggy himself. I really never encountered anyone like him. He was the most extraordinary, memorable uh, volcano of a personality that one could ever hope to meet. And uh, that was the other reason. I, I, I couldn't resist doing this story. Well, I understand there's a short video that we can show to help introduce all of our listeners today to Ziggy's story. Yes, um, anything is, you uh, wanna uh, tell us to help set the stage for what we're about to see? Yeah, toward the end of his life in 2002, toward the end of that year, um, Ziggy agreed to be interviewed by the Spielberg Shoah Foundation and it was the first time he had uh, officially recorded his testimony of his years uh, during the Nazi era. Uh, my production partner and I took audio from those uh, hours of footage and combined it with um, archival photographs and film clips. So what you have here is a, a kind of a brief glimpse of Siggy's life uh, told by Siggy in his own words. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. Richard, can we go ahead and show that four minute film clip?
longer I live, the more I remember. I'm trying to get away from the past, but it isn't possible. I am not liberated yet. I live in Auschwitz every day. I was born in 26 in Koyanke. It was West Prussia, about 155 miles northeast of Berlin. In 35, we left everything. And the next morning, we were in Berlin. Kristalna, I was 12 years old. As a child, and you see synagogues burn. Jewish homes go up in flames. And the police not doing anything. It was like the end of the world. They called it evacuation. That was the word. When the trains pulled up, I looked out of the window. I know we were going east. But going east, didn't mean Auschwitz. We didn't know there was an Auschwitz. How did you survive two years of Auschwitz? It was not my education, which I didn't have any. It was my brain, which I didn't have much. It was the hand of God. What did I do next? I acquired control of Wilshire Oil Company of Texas, a little oil company. I, I bought it piece by piece by piece by piece. I was only the second Jew to become a president of a bank. What kinds of nightmares do you have? Very bad. It's something that is there. You are in Auschwitz every day. I wouldn't want to be anything else. If I would have to go through, God forbid. The same thing. I would go through the same thing as a Jew. So I'd like to bring um, Siggy's son, Ivan, in with us. And Ivan, I'd like to ask you, did you know your father's history growing up? Well, uh, the most traumatic parts of it, he kept uh, a secret at, at, when, at a tender age. Uh, for example, when I saw the big number uh, on his forearm tattooed, I, I, you know, I must have said, Dad or Daddy, what, what, is, what, is that, what is that number on your arm? Since nobody else had one. And uh, he said, oh, I have a bad memory. That's my phone number. I had it uh, written down so I could remember it. So being young and naive and innocent, I said, okay, <laughs> that makes sense. And, uh, and the secret was kept. A few years later, when I was on the playground with uh, my other friends, probably in the first grade, 10 or 11, all my friends were bragging about what their fathers did in World War II. One said, my, fa my father was this uh, private in the army. Another one said, my, 
my father was uh, uh, in the Air Force. Another one said my father was in the Navy. Another one said my father was in the Marines. And then they all pointed at me and said, Ivan, what did your father do during World War II? So uh, I said, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'll have to ask him. I'll get back to you. So I went home and asked my father. I told him what went down on the playground. And he said, uh, couldn't tell him where he really was in death camps. So he told me he made up, he had quite an imagination, which served him throughout his life. And he said, tell them I was a Lieutenant in the French Navy. So I said, okay. So I went back to the playground the next day and I told all my friends, my father was a Lieutenant in the French Navy. And they were all like, wow, because the title, the officer status was higher than all the other children's fathers. And so they were really impressed. But uh, so, so when did he tell me the truth? Probably closer to my, uh, at the age of my bar mitzvah, around 13, did he feel that he could, uh, did he feel that I could handle those kind of horror stories? And of course, from 13 and on, I was able to watch documentaries and, and World War II uh, movies and uh, learn from there also. But uh, there were some things that we didn't, my brother, sister, and I didn't even learn until when he was on, when he was uh, on his last legs, dying of uh, multiple myeloma and giving testimony. Uh, some stories that we had never heard growing up that he gave to Steven Spielberg's uh, Shoah Foundation. Uh, and uh, there, were, there were countless horror stories. And Ivan, you've you've um, really taken it upon yourself and been on a mission to share your father's story. Was there a turning point where you felt the world should know about um, Ziggy and and this history? No, well, we always knew that this was a one of a kind man who did things that no one ever did, and that the world could learn a great deal from it, and had to learn from it in order to not repeat. Uh, some of the mistakes and the horrors that other people have inflicted upon other people. But uh, the purpose it served was mul multiple. One, to preserve the uh, honesty, integrity, and the truth of the Holocaust. When we live in a world of Holocaust deniers who either say it didn't happen at all or that it was exaggerated. Um, so one is to set the record straight and to be part of Holocaust history. Two, the book is the ultimate immigrant story. It doesn't matter whether you're Jewish, Mexican, Chinese, or, or whatever nationality you are. We all came to America as immigrants. And this tells the story of one who is able to overcome all hardship, all troubles, and all tragedy to become one of the most successful businessmen in American history. So it's inspiring for anyone who suffered from any cause. Because if they look at the, my father's story and then look at their story, they're gonna say, wow, yes, I'm poor, or yes, I lost relatives or less, or yes, sickness uh, affected my business. But when they look at what, compared to what he went through, having 59 relatives murdered during the Holocaust, including his mother who was sent straight to the gas chambers and his father was beaten to death and died in his arms. When you look at that tragedy, you'll say, if Siggy could go through all that and become that successful and get over all that pain and live through and, and, and be able to survive the nightmares in order to stay strong, create a new family and be a super productive member of society uh, to the world, not just the Jewish people, it, it'll make people say, if Siggy can do that, if Siggy could go through all that, then I can stay alive, then I can do this. So this book will actually save lives. I see it as a therapeutic tool to help all sufferers of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Uh, and, it's, and it's because of that, of that link I've made between my father's own mild case of PTSD, which was never diagnosed, and that which millions suffer throughout the world can look to this book as inspiration and hope and being able to overcome 
the trauma that they've suffered from whatever cause and place. So Joshua, upon hearing this story, you must have been really taken with it because in, I remember reading in a previous interview, you said after writing so many Holocaust books, you figured you were finished writing about the Holocaust and yet you decided to take on this enormous project. Can you tell us um, what changed your mind to write this book and about the process involved in creating it? Oh wait, Joshua, I'm sorry, we can't hear you. It looks like you might be muted. We are. Oh, try it one more time. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. All right. I'm, I'm in a zone where we might get that little interruption every now and then, but it'll come back. No problem. Um, yeah, I really was uh, quite convinced that I was done with this. Uh, I was in a bit of a depression myself. My wife found me walking around the house with my jaw on the ground, and she insisted that I try to find something else to write about. Um, Ivan was quite convinced that I could do it. You know, he, he encouraged me. Um, and uh, the more he insisted that I read about his father, read the transcript of his testimonies and so on, the more I found something, a story that I really thought really needed to be told. Most, the trajectory of most survivor biographies is fairly well known. There's life prior to the Nazi era, there's the tightening of the noose, there's the deportations, there's the ghettos, there's the camps, the death marches. And for those who survive, there's the trip to a new home, whether in America or Israel. And uh, a, a group photo with the new family at the end. So that's that's the general trajectory of most stories. Um, what Siggy managed to do, and this was unique, and for me, the reason I ultimately decided this is a story that has to be told. Most of the book is not about those dark times in the camp. Three quarters of the book is about him after he comes to America. I mean, uh, Holocaust star, scholar Deborah Lipstadt goes out of her way to mention this in her preface to the book. How did Siggy find the energy to move forward? How did he learn to love again? How did he learn to have a family, to experience joy, to retain his faith in God? I mean, these are critical questions that emerge from this very dark time in history. And Siggy, in his story, in a, in a very memorable, and I might say, an entertaining way, an engaging way, addresses those issues. And I thought that was important for readers. Mm -hmm. And it took you several years to write this book with, um, I believe, countless interviews, researching the history. What, what was the process like with all of the interviews and, and who all were you interviewing to put this together? Right. Well, there were more than 100 interviews we conducted here. Uh, family, friends, former executives from Siggy's companies, Wilshire Oil and Gas of Texas and Trust Company Bank of New Jersey former uh, employees of his companies. Um, there were people from the government, there were uh, customers of his companies and unanimously everyone remembered Siggy as a, a, a beacon of light and, and, and a, a, a heart of gold and someone who would go out of his way no matter how busy he was, if he saw someone in distress or someone who needed help. Um, they remember him for his wicked sense of humor. Um, if I do say so myself, the book's kind of funny because Siggy was very, very funny. Um, and uh, someone who was uh, literally unstoppable. I think the, the title of the book is quite apt. He would not, he had stood up to the worst bullies in history. So when he came to America and had to stand up to anti Semitic bullies, in the industries of oil and banking, he had no problem doing that. He would roll up his sleeve, he'd show them his prisoner number tattooed on his arm and tell them the last person to try to intimidate me was Hitler. He didn't succeed and neither are you. And then he would put on his jacket 
walk out. And, and uh, eventually they elected him CEO and president and, and chairman of the board of their companies because he showed that uh, he had amazing skills for someone who had no formal training in, in oil or banking, his intuitions, he called them fox-like instincts, um, survival instincts that migrated quite well into business in post-war America. So Siggy survived several camps, two death marches, and one of the things that really struck me was that he describes his time in the camp as never knowing what the right decision or choice might be, that there was just no logic to any of it. And you never knew how to make a decision or how to weigh it. And Joshua, I really loved how you were able to weave this in throughout the story and show the impossibility of these choices in the book. And it seemed like at every juncture, he reinvented himself again. He took a chance and um, and really uh, attempted something that maybe he knew or maybe he didn't know, but as you said, he followed his intuition. Can you tell us about some of these instances where he did this? I can, but I wanna preface this by saying, uh, Ivan really deserves a lot of credit here. He, he and I talked long, long, long and hard about issues you know, when you deal with the, uh, the Holocaust, you have to be very, very careful. It's very easy to lapse into sentimentality of, you know, heroism and bravery, which are words that survivors never use to describe themselves. Um, we, everything in the book had to be absolutely accurate, spot on accurate, because we don't want to fuel denial. And when it comes to this particular issue, it's a big subject in Holocaust studies. Was there what we might call agency in the camps? Did survivors, did prisoners in the camps have any control over their own fate whatsoever? There's a scholar named Lawrence Langer, a brilliant man, 93 now, who invented a phrase called choiceless choice. If you look it up, you'll see that he's credited with that. Choiceless choice means that in the camps, there was no good choice. There was a, a choice between bad and worse. You, if you stole a piece of bread, it could keep you alive, but then the person you stole it from would die. If you tried to escape, uh, the, the Nazis would line up 10 other prisoners and mow them down. So you have to live with that realization uh, for the rest of your life. There were no good choices. If a mother saw that a guard was intimidating her daughter, about to shoot her daughter, if the mother spoke up and objected, she would be killed along with her daughter. So there were no good choices. It's what he called choiceless choice. And yet, and yet, and this, this is the great puzzle. When you look at Siggy, who at the ripe old age of 17, had the, the moxie to, when he heard guards talking about how they need bricklayers, walk right up and say, oh, he'd take off his cap very respectfully and say, I've had three years as a master bricklayer. Later, he explained for an interview, he knew about as much as of, about bricklaying as you do about belly dancing. <laughs> but he would invent these things to stay alive. And then he heard they needed a, a doctor's aide. Oh, I've, I've spent five years working in hospitals as a doctor's aide. He couldn't stand to, be a, to see a chicken slaughtered, let alone people being operated with without anesthesia. And it, <laughs> he, he would come up with the most amazing inventions to stay alive. It was an extraordinary thing. So you can't say that there's no agency. If he hadn't done that, if he hadn't tried, he would have simply died sooner. So it was a big issue that Ivan and I spent a lot of time uh, talking about. And I think the bottom line here is this. You can't blame someone for being killed in the camp by saying, oh, they didn't have the will to live. There were some people where I live on Long Island who wanted to do a documentary. I said, well, show me some, they want me to advise. So I said, show me something. And on their promotional paper, it said, these survivors here on Long Island, they embody everything that is courageous about the human spirit. They embody the will to live. All right, time out a second. The 6 million who didn't live, they didn't have the human spirit. They didn't have a will to survive. You know, we, 
we vault things up to a certain level because we want closure. We want to be get up, to be able to get up tomorrow and get on with our lives. Siggy was unique, and it's one very important reason why I agreed to to do this book. There's something about Siggy Wilzig's story that reminds us that human beings are extraordinarily resourceful creatures. And even under the most extreme circumstances, if you lift your head up from the despair and, and look for opportunities, I think Siggy would say, the almighty will help you. He will give you an idea that you might have not have thought of otherwise. In one, in one interview, there's this great quote from him and he, interrupts the interviewer who's interviewing him and the interviewer is asking about, you know, trying to put the interview chronologically. And he says, I lived from minute to minute and yeah. you're going from year to year. Right. And I just thought that is such a powerful quote because how he lived his life during this really difficult time period was just from second to second, just making these decisions and adjusting at, at every point over and over again. Absolutely. And, and you can't uh, dismiss testimony because there might be some factual error in it. I mean, there are Holocaust scholars who are very distrustful of testimony. They prefer paper documentation because they say survivors are selective in their memories, their memories are faulty, uh, they'll make up things just to present themselves in a better light. They don't want people to know what they actually had to do to survive. Um, the uh, French scholar and survivor Charlotte Delbo described that when she presents her memories of life in the camp, she says, I can't guarantee that it is truth, but I can assure you it is truthful. So hmm. there's a distinction there. Survive, prisoners didn't have calendars. If they, if they didn't know that such and such a thing happened on a Thursday or a Saturday, you can't fault them for that. Mm -hmm. So after the war, um, Siggy gets this uh, remarkable position helping to track down and capture Nazis. Can you tell us a little bit about how did he end up in this role, still a teenager, um, in yet another kind of unusual twist to his story. Ivan, you want to, you want to take that one? Well he, spoke, well, he spoke fluent German for one, which was very helpful uh, to the American uh, counterintelligence. That was probably uh, the main reason they hired him, uh, even though he, well, he volunteered, but the main reason they took, uh, were happy to have him. and. Uh, he probably uh, presented himself with the same zeal and energy uh, that he did towards everything in his life. And so he probably showed the enthusiasm to uh, help them uh, nab as many uh, Nazi war criminals as he could. Yeah, there's that one great story when he was uh, uh, in a town where there were a lot of former Nazis and uh, they were they got they got some information that in this one very fancy apartment they think the people in town thought maybe you'll find a, a former Nazi there, so they went up and um, Siggy had a team of three 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 or four people with him. They combed through the apartment, couldn't find anything, so they went down and they were going to go back to the counterintelligence office. And then Siggy said, "You guys go ahead. I want to go. <laughs> I want to go back upstairs. There's something we didn't look at." And when he realized this was a hot day in July and he saw ashes in the fireplace and he's thinking, who, who, makes, who makes a fire in the, in the middle of July? So sure enough, he sticks his hand into the ashes in the fireplace and he pulls out photographs of the guy who owns the apartment as a, 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 a cyclist, you know, getting gold medals. And there were papers signed by some uh, senior officers in, in the Nazi party. So he realized that this guy was indeed a former uh, Nazi uh, sympathizer and official. And uh, it ended up uh, with his arrest and a, a, a number of other arrests as well. But those are the kinds of intuitions that he would come up with. He, he saw things other people didn't see. 
so you keep, call, you keep calling them intuition, you keep calling them instincts. Instincts. <laughs> instincts is what I had. He had fox-like instincts. He heard, he heard things other people didn't hear. He saw details and things that other people didn't see. And uh, he smelled something going on that other people didn't necessarily smell. And uh, that's, uh, that helped keep him alive in the camps. That helped to make him uh, a, a super successful businessman because he nicknamed, he nicknamed himself Eagle Eye. Uh, he could tell when something was one sixteenth of an inch off. If, if a picture wasn't hanging level, he'd say it's not straight. The carpenter that would put up the picture said, it is straight. I measured it with a ruler. My father would say, I'm telling you, it's not straight. <laughs> the man would argue and say, I measured it, it's straight. Sure enough, when he'd go back and measure it, it was a 16th of an inch off. So, I mean, it was that, it was that, it was that precise. Same thing when he was, uh, uh, when he was a businessman. And, and had to decide what companies to invest in, not invest in, buy stock in, what companies to take over, not take over. He read the fine print. He didn't just read the fine print in the annual, in the annual reports of these companies. He read the footnotes for, for, every, for every line in the annual report. And in the footnotes is where, you, is where you learn where they're trying to hide something or they're trying to finagle it and put it in the wrong column. And figure things out. So it was his expertise in analyzing uh, these type of financial reports and what he would be self-learned, what he would learn from uh, reading newspapers and ma business magazines and and uh, on uh, on his own. Since he so never, Ivan, his, I I just have this this image that as the child of Ziggy it would be impossible to pull something by them. I mean, I try to imagine his children as teenagers and kids and, you know, having this father who really can see between the lines or can see, you know, those slight variations and differences can kind of sense out when things are amiss. Did you feel that as, you know, as his child that you really couldn't get anything by him? Yeah, I, we, <laughs> Of course, <laughs> of course, we knew how we, we knew how intelligent he was. We knew who out of out of the ordinary, how brilliant he was, how his mind worked, um, and he was strict. So we didn't have that much incentive to try and pull something. Hmm. You knew you'd get caught for it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and 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 hear and hear the bark, hear the bark mm -hmm. as a result of it. Yeah. So we have this wonderful picture of Ziggy after he comes to the United States and he's dressed in a suit. And um, Richard, I'm hoping you'll pull that picture up for us and either Joshua or Ivan, maybe one of you can tell us about this picture and the, the context for it. Well, he's, he's 23, year old, 23 years old here. It's just a couple of years after he's arrived in America. So that would put it around 1949. And um, he, he came here, the Nazis had closed schools to Jews. So he had no education beyond grade school. He had no money. He had saved up $240 from odd jobs before he came to America. And, and, and uh, that's not gonna last long. He didn't have uh, contacts or, or you know, big business people sponsoring him or anything. Um, he really started with, with nothing. He knew though that first impressions were important. So when he came over, he had purchased a, a nice coat for himself. If you look at the image on the cover of the book, you see he's wearing a very nice coat. He, uh, he presented himself very professionally, in a very, very nice way. Um, and yet when he first started, his first, his first job was shoveling snow uh, in the worst blizzard in, in 50 years in American history in, in December of 47. Then from that, he graduated to cleaning toilets in, the, in sweatshops. After that, he got a job selling ties from the, from the trunk of a, a, he bought a used car and him, he and his, uh, his friend, Larry Nartel headed out and they sold neckties going door to door. And uh, with a little bit of, uh, of commissions from selling ties. He saved some money and he started buying, buying stocks. And what you see here, I, I like this photo very much because the, the, this is 
this this shows his determination. You know, <laughs> he's got nothing, but he looks like a million bucks. You know, and 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 uh, there isn't anything that's going to stand in his way. So Siggy seems like he had such a passion for life, and I think the title of the book, Unstoppable, is such a perfect title. Um, he also seems like behind the humor and the ingenuity, there was also this darker reality. And as he said in the short film that we watched, he's in Auschwitz every day, that you never really leave Auschwitz. And I wonder, um, Ivan, if you can tell us a little bit about, you know, what else Ziggy was like in real life and, and what was it like growing up with this person? And I wanna reference a great picture we have um, that you were sharing with us earlier uh, of your father and fishing. Well, he was uh, a, a super father. Uh, it was amazing that given the fact that he was a workaholic and we didn't see much of him uh, in the early days as children growing up, he never ever went on a vacation without his children. Most parents don't even consider it a vacation unless they left the children behind. In his case, no vacation and no happiness was unless he had his children with him. That was one unique thing. Another thing is, is 90% of most kids in America go to, uh, uh, that can afford to go to sleepaway camp and send their kids to sleepaway camp every summer. Nothing doing with Siggy. He would not want to be without his children for that long a period of time. And so he sent us to day camp instead to learn sports and have fun with other friends our age. He enjoyed fishing because it was extremely re relaxing and peaceful, uh, particularly at Kutcher's Country Club where this photo is taken and my younger brother is seen pulling out a, a nice sized bass, I believe. But uh, he loved Kutcher's. He loved Kutcher's Country Club in Monticello, New York because he was around fellow Jews and fellow, and fellow survivors and he spoke their language. And he, he himself, the late great uh, uh, Jackie Mason just passed away, but my father was every bit as funny and entertained, uh, whether it was at Kutcher's, not on stage, or whether it was the uh, uh, whatever kosher hotel we stayed at in Miami Beach, the Saxony Hotel, uh, also a kosher hotel with, uh, with a lot of uh, survivors stayed and, 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 their, and their families. It was the entertainment nonstop by the pool in the lobby and, and everyone was uh, always fascinated uh, by his voice, by his stories. Uh, he, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was charming, he was irresistible. Uh, women adored him, if you could see his, his head of hair, his big head of wavy hair. Um, so he would flirt back, <laughs> even in front of my mother, she got used to it because he had such a beautiful head of wavy hair that he kept, even, even when he had chemo, he kept that big head of wavy hair. It was just amazing. And it was always flying all over the place. So whether, we, whether he was waltzing my mother uh, on, the, on, the grand, on the grand ballroom of the Waldorf Astoria, uh, or uh, uh, he was just a, a wonderful human being with his jokes, uh, dancing, entertaining, uh, networking, seeing other people, seeing that other people were happy at all times and going uh, out of his way. If there was any uh, tourists or problems in the family, uh, he would be the people that people would pick Siggy, the peacemaker, because he would be able to, uh, to uh, they both respected him and he, they would know he would come up with a great solution. There's, there's a little bit of a backstory to that photo uh, that's worth mentioning as well, which is that um, Siggy loved making children happy. Having, having seen children mercilessly slaughtered uh, in Auschwitz and, and in the ghettos, uh, if he could make a child happy, uh, it gave him the greatest pleasure in life. It he was a very religious man, very, very deeply religious man. But the one anomaly, you might say, in his relationship with the Almighty was the one and a half million children who died during the Holocaust uh, under the age of 15, I think the statistic is. 
that one anomaly it caused him a lot of a lot of troubles. So if there was ever an opportunity to make a child happy, like helping him catch a fish, uh, he was right. Let there. me let me tell that story, Joshua. Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What my father would do is catch a fish, leave leave it on the, leave it on the hook, and then he would see a father and son approaching. And, and when they would get up to him, he would turn to the child and say, have you ever gone fishing before? The child would say, no. He would look up at his father like, he'd say, well, you, you want to try it? He'd look at his father, can I do it? Do I have permission? The father would say, go ahead. And my father would hand him the pole. <laughs> of course, neither the child or the child's father knew that there was already a fish on the hook. And he would give him a little fishing lesson and say, you, you, see, that, you see that red and white float? When it starts to move around and there's a ripple in the water, that means the fish is nibbling. And when the fish pulls it all the way down, that means you got a bite and you probably, you probably caught the fish. So the child would sit there, the, uh, the fish would start to swim away, the, uh, the float would go down, he'd say, pull up, pull up, reel, you know, reel it in, reel it in. And the kid would pick up a fish and give a, as my father would say, give a gashry or, or a holler. What, what, uh, you did it, you did it. And the kid would be jumping for joy. He caught his first fish, something he'll never forget in his entire life. And that leads to another fish story that was only Siggy, only Siggy would do such a thing. He would take all the fish from the day, carp, sunfish, uh, pickerel, <laughs> bats, catfish, didn't matter. Catch 15, 20 fish, and he would bring them all up in buckets. To, the, to his bathtub in the hotel room at Butcher's and create a giant fish tank in his hotel room, in the bathtub, in the bathroom for all the kids in the hotel to come up and see. So obviously, the first time the maids, the housekeepers, saw all these fish flopping around in the bathtub, they nearly had a heart attack. But once they learned that he did it for the children in the hotel to make them happy, they calmed down. And then he would let the cleaning ladies take home their pick of the their pick of the catch to take the fish home and fry them for dinner that night. And that's how he made peace with them. But he was he was so outlandish in his sense of humor and the things he would do to give people joy. I love that story. Um, before we turn to uh, questions from our audience, I want to just point out the quote that was shown in the short video that we watched that was really his motto for life. And it read, free men who forget their bitter past do not deserve a bright future. And it seemed like he really lived by this motto and had it um, printed large in his office. Did you feel like this was something that he brought up frequently and referenced in, in his living of life. Well, he, he more than brought it up. It was the incentive and the fuel that drove him to lecture dozens and dozens of times at, at Boston University for Elie Wiesel's Holocaust Studies, at Brown University where my sister went to school, where, where at University of Pennsylvania on uh, Armenian Genocide Day, he lectured on the Barry Farber show, he lectured for the governor uh, of the state of New Jersey. He, and he, and, and that's why the- West Point, don't Holocaust, forget West Point. And West Point Military Academy was the first Holocaust survivor in history to lecture at West Point Military Academy. Thank you, Joshua. And he, uh, and he was Elie Wiesel's right-hand man. Once uh, President Carter appointed Wiesel, Wiesel said, the first man I want on the, on the council with me is Siggy Wilson. He picked my father out of every businessman or every Jew and every survivor in the country to be his right man. Because Elie Wiesel, who you can see there sitting next to Reagan uh, uh, by the podium, was a genius, was a poet, was an author, was a lecturer. But he didn't know one thing about business and he knew it. And so he chose my father to be the business arm to, and to help raise the, the, the massive funds for that Holocaust Museum and, uh, and Memorial in Washington, DC. And you're going to see Kennedy on the far left. And uh, Joe Lantos sitting next to him. 
Santos, Holocaust right? Holocaust survivor and elected to Congress? Yes, yes. This was, uh, so, so yes, uh, the uh, telling the history and making sure the whole world knew about it forever was his paramount motivation in life. And, uh, and while he might have, and while he might have had to become a, a workaholic to, 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 to get to not to, to, forget, to get over the nightmares, um, he was driven, driven like no other. And uh, as a result of it, he met four presidents of the United States because they liked to pick his brain. He was a smart man. Well, there's a, there's a question here for either one of you um, from Martin who asks, could one of you speak to the story of how he met and eventually married his wife? Well, it was the fruit vendor. <laughs> yes, in those days, in those days, in the old days, uh, you'd have a, a, a fruit and vegetable vendor that would deliver fresh fruit door to door from a truck. And he saw my mother who was babysitting uh, at her sister's house in Clifton, New Jersey, and saw that she was a beautiful young Jewish single girl, said, you want to meet a handsome Jewish man that I know that I also sell fruit to in the other part, on the other side of town. She said, sure, why not? Uh, he, he, he wanted to meet my, meet my mother. My mother wanted to meet him. So the fruit man made the shit up, <laughs> made the match. Uh, and Siggy said, I couldn't afford a, a, a fifth. What was it? <laughs> I couldn't said, afford it. I couldn't afford to pick you up in a, in, in, in a, in a, like a $10,000 car. car. So I came to pick you up in a $40,000 bus. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was his cute way of uh, charming my mother because he was very poor and my mother uh, came from a more affluent family. But uh, I don't want to give away the book, but it involves them eloping and a lot of drama and it, 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 worked, out, it worked out fine because first my father, uh, her, uh, my mother's father didn't want to accept him not knowing uh, whether he was all there and whether he was good enough for their daughter, and he turned out to be uh, the favorite son-in-law, <laughs> and the one that and the one that her father went to for business advice because he was that bright. So there's another question that um, comes from Tom, and he asks, "How and when did Siggy have the opportunity to learn English?" Well, he picked, he picked up half a, he picked up a half a dozen different languages yeah. in the camps. He was just good at it. Just like he was good. He had a good head for numbers without ever having studied math. When it came to addition, subtraction, division, and multiplication, there was nobody better. It, and he'd, he'd be able to do things in his head without even having to write it down. Hmm. But he never took calculus and trigonometry and, and, and more advanced mathematical studies that every child in America takes, and algebra, and things like that, just the basics. And similarly, uh, because he was able to pick up languages in the camps, whether it was a little Russian, a little Czech, a little, a little Polish, um, I'm sure he, he picked up the, uh, his English improved uh, the year or two that he worked for the American counterintelligence, because he was surrounded by people that spoke English. He also understood how important it was to uh speak well. And um, uh, Ivan, you used to tell me about how often uh, you'd sit with your father when you were a boy and you'd watch documentary films on television and the History Channel and... and uh, um, Alan, my brother did that mainly. Yeah. And yeah. then I've had family members say to me that uh, once Siggy got into business, he developed a Shakespearean kind of oratory. I mean, he really became a very eloquent uh, speaker and very dramatic. He knew when to lean forward when he was making a point, when to raise a finger, when to grab the sides of the podium. And you know, he really was an engaging speaker. And and uh, people remembered that uh, very clearly about him. Well, I have one final question for either or both of you, and that is, if Siggy were here with us today in 2021. What 
what do you think his message or a piece of advice might be for all of us here? Ivan, why don't you start with that, that one? Well, it would be for one, make Holocaust education and other genocides, not just the Jewish genocide, make that all a mandatory course in every high school in America and every college in America, because what could be worse than mass murder? And in that, and in those courses, you'll realize and, and, and teach young people that it doesn't just start with gas chambers or mass killings. It all starts with bullying. It starts with name calling, which when, uh, when nobody does anything to stop it, leads to physical violence. And if nobody does anything to stop it, it leads to a murder. Nobody does anything to stop it. It leads to mass murder. So you have to, you have to uh, teach the young so that they can teach others. Uh, in addition, he would, he, would, he would want everyone in the world to know that no matter how bad things are, life is more important and you should stay alive and not commit suicide or become a drug addict or an alcoholic or run away from home or, or, whatever, or whatever horrible things can happen from uh, people who are depressed and feeling hopeless. His answer would be, look what I did, look what I went through, follow in my footsteps and you'll be happy again one day. Mm -hmm. Joshua, did you want to add to that? No, I have nothing to add to that. That was perfect. That's a, it's a powerful message. Yeah. It's a powerful message. Thank you both so much for being with us today and sharing this incredible story. I encourage everyone out there who hasn't yet read this book to please do so. Um, you can find the book at your local bookseller, online, um, just about anywhere. It's called Unstoppable by Joshua M. Green. Ivan and Joshua, thank you again for, for sharing these stories with us and, and your incredible passion. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you kindly. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who joined in our program today. This program was recorded and you'll be able to find it on our website starting tomorrow. I wanna give a very special thank you to Richard Green, our museum and technology director, who's running the technical side of this show behind the scenes. Also a huge thank you to our executive director, Dee Simon, and to our entire team, Lori Warshall-Cohen, Nicole Bella, Julia Thompson, Paul Regelbrug, Ellie Selesky, Amanda Davis, Rick Brewer, Katie Lawrence, Morgan Romero, and Devonshire Lockie. And after 66 straight weeks of Lunch and Learn program, we will be taking a break in August and we'll be featuring some of our favorite Lunch and Learn programs from the past year during this time. And stay tuned for an incredible lineup of speakers starting in mid-September. Thank you so much to everyone for all of the support and for being a part of this program over these many weeks. And this concludes our program for today.